prediction. Thank you, Gail. Oh, thank you. Welcome uh, to everyone from here from here in Australia. <laughs> this evening in Australia. Uh, thank you very much for coming, for, for, for tuning in. <laughs> this is a, a most uh, unusual situation for all of us, but uh, it's, it's kind of strangely intimate and friendly. Um, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go. Uh, I have to start with an apology though, because you're actually not going to see any explicitly ABC work. Um, although I will mention the word a couple of times. Um, what you're going to see, though, is uh, is an example of work that uh, moves away from the the standard likelihood-based Bayesian paradigm. So, in that sense, the work falls under the the general umbrella, if you like, of likelihood-free Bayesian statistics. So, I think it fits well enough with the uh, the theme of the seminar series. So, so I'm here. <laughs> okay. So, this is uh, joint work with David Fraser and uh, Ruben, our postdoc, and they are both in the audience, I see, and uh, we're, we're all from uh, Monash. And we refer to the work as a focused Bayesian prediction, uh, but to understand where the focus uh, comes into play, uh, we have to kind of remind ourselves a little bit of uh, the some of the key aspects of, of, of standard Bayesian prediction, so just bear with me for, for, for a moment or two. The quantity of interest, of course, in, in Bayesian prediction is the probability distribution of the uh, future random variable conditioned on, oh, I have to go over here, sorry, uh, con <laughs> conditioned on the uh, observed data, okay? And where the uh, other unknowns in the problem, the, uh, the parameters that characterize the assumed model having been integrated out. And I'm just looking at one step ahead uh, prediction here just, just for the sake of uh, for, for illustration. Now, this joint distribution here of yn plus 1 and theta can, of course, be decomposed into the product of the predictive for yn plus 1 conditional on theta and the posterior distribution of theta. So this, if you like, marginal uh, predictive distribution is simply the posterior expectation of the conditional predictive. And that can predictive is going to reflect the structure of the assumed model or the assumed data generating process as uh, is of course the posterior itself through its dependence on the likelihood function via Bayes theorem. Now in the usual case where we can't get our hands on this uh, expectation analytically well we can even take M draws from the posterior and you know, via our favourite MCMC chain and we can use those draws to estimate the expectation either by taking a, 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 a sample average of the conditional predictives or by drawing the future values from each one of the conditional predictives and using those draws to produce a density estimate of the marginal predictive. So the point is that a, that a simulation scheme like MCMC enables exact Bayesian prediction to be performed, uh, at least up to simulation error, so up to the hat. But there are a couple of Achilles heels in all this. Firstly, what happens when we can't generate an MCMC chain because we can't access that exact posterior, either because the likelihood function is unavailable in closed form uh, or because the number of observations is so large that pointwise evaluation of the likelihood function inside an MCMC chain is simply computationally feasible or possibly because the dimension of the unknowns is just too large to enable uh, efficient exploration of the parameter space uh, via an MCMC chain. Well, in any one of these cases, okay, we're stuck. Exact Bayesian prediction is just not feasible. It's out, it's out the window. And that's the sort of problem that we and others, others before us, uh, have tackled in other work where we use an ABC approximation to the exact posterior and thereby produce an ABC-based approximation of the exact predictive. So we did that first and then we've moved on along with, again, with others to using a variational Bayes approximation to the exact posterior and thereby producing a variational Bayes based approximation to the exact 
predicted. And a key message from both of these strands of work is that as long as the assumed data generating process is correctly specified, so in other words, it tallies with the, the process that has actually generated the data, and of course you can only assess that in a simulation setting, uh, then pretty crude approximations to the exact posterior can still lead to accurate approximations to the exact predictive. But today or tonight <laughs> here in Australia, uh, in this work, we're tackling what is really the more fundamental and challenging problem. What do you do when you acknowledge that any model that you assume, any predictive model you assume, is going to be misspecified? Would you expect any approximation to the predictive? Uh, to be a good approximation to the exact predictive and more critic when that when that predictive model is wrong and more critically in what sense is the exact predictive where of course that misspecification is going to impinge upon its two components so the conditional predictive over which we average and the posterior distribution itself through its dependence on the likelihood function in what sense does that exact predictive remain the gold standard anymore why would we bother with this type of uh, calculation once we acknowledge that the predictive model is wrong? Likely, most likely to be wrong or misspecified. So that's what's really prompted us to think about a new way of approaching and prediction that's realistic or, or appropriate, if you like, in this you know, realistic setting in which we don't know what the true data generating process is. We acknowledge that and we also acknowledge that any assumption we make about it is going to be wrong. So what we do is start with a class of conditional predictives that we believe could have generated the data. So a class of plausible uh, conditional predictives, if you like. And we're just going to call those uh, predictives in that class uh, P. And of course, they're going to be dependent on past data because they're predictives. And they're going to be dependent on some unknowns. Now, of course, they may be predictives associated with a parametric model that's indexed by a vector parameter's theta, but they don't have to be. Uh, they could be weighted combinations of predictives associated with uh, different parametricals or indeed predictives associated with well, you know, any weighted combinations of any sorts of uh, predictives. Um, and in principle, they could be non-parametric conditional distributions. Now, of course, we're Bayesian, so our starting point is placing a prior over the unknowns. Now, in principle, the way we're thinking about this is to place the prior over the predictive, the predictive elements themselves. So there, if you like, the uh, primitives of the analysis and the essence of the idea is to update the prior to a posterior via predictive performance. So in other words, and this is where the, the word is coming in here, that predictive, or sorry, that posterior that we produce over the predictives is focused uh, on elements of the predictive class that have high predictive accuracy and different user specified different problem specific measures of predictive accuracy are going to quite appropriately lead to different posteriors as will different ways of incorporating those measures of predictive accuracy into the updating mechanism what we're doing in this paper is measuring predictive accuracy in one particular way and that is via uh, a set of scoring rules via a, a proper scoring rule of one sort or another, which um, uh, assigns a positive score, so we're using positively oriented scores, to an element of the predictive class when a future value of the random variable arises. And that score has a particular expectation under the unknown truth that's just denoted as such. And if we use just shorthand notation uh, for a generic predictive at any particular t plus one and appropriate notation for the predictive that we're interested in, that we're particularly interested in, which of course is the predictive at little n plus one, then we denote the sum of the scores over a sample of size little n as such. 
and that is our sample criterion. And we played around a bit with embedding that sample criterion into the updating step. So we've tried quite a lot of things there, including indeed initially um, using AB, ABC principles, uh, one form or another. But in the end, we've kind of defaulted to the simplest and in, in some sense really the most obvious way of doing this, and that is by using a coherent update based on the exponential scaled version of the sum of the scores. So very much in the spirit of this variety of uh, generalised Bayesian inferential methods, that are around and that many of you will be familiar with that indeed adopt this type of exponential update of a scaled loss function of some sort or another. So what we're doing is really taking the spirit of that generalised uh, inferential work explicitly into the prediction setting. And just by the way, to, to, to uh, clarify what that word coherent means, in case you're, you're not sure, uh, some of the students in particular, uh, that, that simply means that the uh, result we get, the posterior we get over here, is invariant to whether or not we use two sequential sets of data here in one hit, or whether we do the updating in two steps. And the exponential function ensures that uh, invariance or that coherence, if you like. Okay, now obviously if we choose the log score for a parametric model that's indexed by theta and we set the scale equal to 1, then we're going to recover the potentially misspecified conventional likelihood-based update for the parameters of that parametric predictive, okay, from which we can extract a posterior over the predictives themselves. But other choices of scoring rule scoring rules will, will lead to updates that are driven by other measures of predictive performance. And that's the whole point of the exercise. Okay, well this 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 scale function, of course this W, I mean scale or weight, which whatever you want to call it, that determines obviously the, the, the relative weight of the sample uh, based criterion uh, to the prior. And that's going to determine and, you know, have an impact, obviously, on the resultant uh, posterior, uh, the nature of that posterior, including its variance, critically. And so we've got to choose something sensible. And, yes, yeah, well, for those of you who are familiar with this uh, generalised inferential uh, literature, you'll know there is no one way of doing it. Now, it turns out that in our context, where we have a particular focus, if you like, on prediction, then asymptotically, so as the sample size goes to infinity, that choice of that, that scaling factor doesn't actually matter in the sense that, and you can see all the proofs uh, in, in, in the paper, uh, as under regularity, um, as, as long as that weight is bounded, then asymptotically, that posterior over the predictives will do exactly what we want it to do, and that is to concentrate on the, on the particular predictor that maximises <laughs> the expected score. I'll come to Herman, that maximises the expected score. So in other words, well, more, more, more precisely, maximises the limit, okay, of the expectation of the, of, of the uh, sample mean of the scores, okay. So that's what will happen no matter what the value of W, uh, Asymptotically, yeah. I'll, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll, I'll listen to him. Yeah. Can I hear him? He has to be un, 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 so un un mute. So on, on mute and, and ask the question. I do unmute. So now I can ask the question. Yes, yep, yep. Go, Herman. Okay. No, so I was wondering, since you also say I can have sets, of uh, 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 close to non-parametric, but you use uh -huh. here, you use here yeah. only a scale W n. Uh, okay. What, what would happen if you say 
I really have to scale uh, different in comb combining different predictions or the predictive densities. And uh, can I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you okay. want to keep going? That's it. Okay, so I probably should have clarified at the outset that uh, we are in this paper only considering predictive uh, densities that are themselves parametric, or we're considering combinations where, and I'll kind of say a little bit more about this as I go along, uh, where the par parameters are being viewed as the, as the weights. Yes, okay, so we have always a finite set of unknowns that we're dealing with. Okay. Now those those parametric predictives are going to kind of sit underneath those scoring rules, but we're only ever going to have one scaling factor that weights the average or the, the, the sum of the scores. So I've kind of said two things there. Okay, so we only have one scaling rule at the moment. Okay, that's all we're doing, no matter how we are producing the predictives. But we are only ever producing the predictives via single model parametric models uh, or via combinations of predictives where the parameters, uh, the, the weights of those combinations play the role of the parameters. Okay, so perhaps, perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that later because there's, yeah. There's probably more that can be said and done about uh, about W. Okay, so that's that's quite an important part of this kind of uh, work that we're we're dealing with it in a particular way at the moment, and there's just the one scaling factor. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so certainly asymptotically, that uh, that scaling factor is not going to matter, but obviously in finite samples it potentially will. And again, we have tried uh, a, a few different things here, and we've settled upon something that we think is sensible. And that is if we have uh, an exponential of the sum of the scores, i.e. the scoring rule is such that the exponential of the sum of the scores defines a probability or a PDF ordinate, then we just set the weight to one because we have a natural weighting there between the sample base criterion and the prior. They're both probabilities or probability density ordinates. Okay. When that is not the case, uh, then what we are doing at the moment is setting the scale such that the variance of the resultant posterior is roughly speaking equivalent to the variance of some sensible benchmark, like, for example, the exact but misspecified likelihood based posterior. Okay. Here we come to the mixtures because here uh, I wanted to remind people, in fact, that of course this predictive class um, is such that it can, the elements of that class can themselves be comb weighted combinations of predictives associated with different models. Um, and, and for example, linear combinations, so our linear pools, but they do not have to be uh, linear combinations, but that's an example. And if we were to take the constituent predictives here as given, um, or estimated in a preliminary step, if you like, then of course, then you can see that the elements of the predictive class are, character are characterized uh, purely by, by the weights. Yeah. And so that is indeed placing inside this formal coherent Bayesian updating scheme this whole idea of uh, estimating weighted combinations of predictives via predictive criteria and of course as, as many will know there is a large literature on this a large frequentist literature and of course um, some, some Bayesian literature where, where uh, Herman of course has played a role so we're, we're providing an alternative uh, if you like to that other uh, Bayesian literature that um, uh, produces weighted combinations uh, using predictive criteria in one way or another yeah. okay so in the paper we you know uh, as usual, we, we have results based on uh, simulated and empirical data. And I'm going to show you first uh, what sort of results we're producing, the type of results, how we're kind of characterising the results uh, with some simulated data first before showing you some empirical results. 
Well, we're econometricians, so we play around with financial models to some extent. So this is a familiar model to many people, not to, not to everyone perhaps, but this is a, um, a model that is trying to capture the stylized features of a financial return and means that its variance is going to be time varying autocorrelated and potentially random. And we're also producing a marginal distribution for the return that is negatively skewed. Okay, so typical features of financial returns. Uh, of course, when it comes to uh, financial returns, uh, predicting returns that are either very large or very small is what is important. And so that's going to be our focus in this problem. And that's, of course, going to determine uh, an appropriate scoring rule to use in the update. We're going to use three different predictive classes. The first one's based on a Gaussian autoregressive conditional heteroscedastic model of order one. And so again, for people who are not familiar with, with that sort of acronym, doesn't matter. It's The point is that it's a, a simpler, conditionally deterministic time varying volatility model that is most likely to be quite a misspecified version of the true data generating process. Certainly it's not going to capture any of the skews. Second class is going to be based on a generalized arch model, so a more general and more flexible model if you like. And then the third class, a simple linear combination of arch and garch predictives, one of which is allowing for some skews. So you can kind of guess that what we're doing here is we're allowing for uh, predictive classes that are increasingly less misspecified. And of course, we, we play with several different things and we document um, the results for lots of different scores in the paper. But what I'm going to do is just show you the results for two different scores. Firstly, the log score, which of course uh, equates to the standard likelihood based update. So I'm going to call those results exact Bayes. And then the censored log score, uh, which explicitly rewards predictive accuracy in a tail. And we just use a standard MCMC algorithm to draw predictives from the posterior distribution over the predictives, which of course equates in practice to drawing the factors in the two single model cases and which equates to drawing the weights in the predictive combination case. And we take those draws and we use those draws in an obvious way to estimate the mean predictive for each of the two posteriors that we're creating here by the two different updatings. And we use that representative uh, distributional forecast. We take that out of sample and we roll the whole process forward with expanding windows and we assess predictive performance over an out of sample period via the censored log score. So we have two forms of updating and one out of sample assessment that matches one of the forms of the updating. So the first obvious question to ask is, does the within sample update based on the censored score uh, produce the best out of sample performance measured by that score? As of course, symptotic concentration results or result uh, tell us should happen. Secondly, does the degree of misspecification of the predictive class matter. Firstly, does less misspecification mean less difference in the out of sample performance of the different updates? And anyone who's familiar with this world of uh, proper scoring rules would, would uh, suggest that the answer to that question should be yes. Uh, perhaps more interestingly though, does misspecification have a differential impact on the performance of the different updates? So I'm going to, in the interest of time, just focus on upper tail accuracy. And I'm just going to focus on the results for the most misspecified ARCH1 class and the least misspecified linear combination or mixture class. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, the green line is the sequence of Average census out of sample censored score uh, scores for the for the upper ten percent tail using the likelihood based update so the Bayes exact update over 
expanding evaluation windows and, of course, underpinned by the ARCH1 predictive class. The blue line is the corresponding result when the update is based on the 10% censored score itself. So the focused Bayesian prediction result, as we call it, where we're focusing in the update on that upper tail accuracy. And you can see, thank heavens, the blue line is much higher than the green. So in other words, focusing in the update on the predictive accuracy that we're interested in does indeed produce out of sample more, more, more accuracy in the upper tail. Okay. Now, when we uh, move to what is arguably a much uh, less misspecified class, the mixture class, then three things happen. Firstly, the blue line is still higher than the green, but certainly those two sets of results are obviously much closer one to the other, okay, as we really would uh, anticipate. But importantly, it's the green line that's coming up to meet the blue. The blue line is staying pretty put. So in other words, the, the, the focus Bayesian prediction is more robust in the sense that it is changing less in response to changes in the predictive class. And that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay, but maybe I'll answer Andy's question first <laughs> before I continue there. Okay, can we can we unmute Andy? Andy has unmuted himself. He's unmuted himself. You don't have that power. Go on. <laughs> Oh, I thought I heard. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, it's just a quick question, and this graph on the right yep. hand side here brings it up. And that is before you started talking about this simulated data, <clears throat> yep. you introduced this theta sub k. And I was going to leave it till the end to ask what that was. But I know that oh, in, yeah. order, in order to get this second graph, you've got to choose theta one and theta two, because it's obviously a weighted average of the two constituent models. So what is the theta case or what are they? And what is it designed to do? <clears throat> okay. So the 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 theta case in the predictive class in the mixture oh, sorry in the, the predictive combination case, yeah. our parameters yeah. are those weights. So they are simply the, the the weights that we produce, you know, we produce a posterior we produce posterior draws of those weights through the MCMC scheme. Okay, and they then produce associated predictive distributions. Okay, a combination of depending on the particular draws that we get of those weights. Okay, so that's kind of going back, if you like, I can just I can go back there, that's fine, uh, to uh, this that's comment here about the MCMC. yeah, that's the one, that's all. yeah, that's it, yeah. Okay, so we just have an MCMC scheme where our, our underpinning parameters in the case of the linear combination, linear combination. are the thetas. Right, okay. okay. Those, those theta, the theta k's. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, that's fine. Yeah. Am I all right? Am I still all right? Have I gone strange? No? Are we right now? I think it's okay again. Somebody had the mic on. Okay. So okay. I, I okay. Fine, I'll turn right. the mic off. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so this 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 issue of robustness is, is kind of really what I wanted to draw out most uh, most uh, in, 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 in this uh, in this graph here. Um, the fact that the focus method is robust to the choice of predictive class absolutely makes sense. Focusing on getting a particular characteristic of the data right, so accuracy in the tails in this particular example, um, should mean that getting the model itself wrong should matter less. And that's exactly what, what, what we're seeing. And of course, that robustness is also very handy because it means that we can use a crude, computationally simple predictive class like the ARCH1 model in this particular example to do the job. So we don't kind of have to go to the extra work of estimating, say, a predictive combination in order to better capture the true data generating process, because that's not the aim. 
The aim is simply to accurately predict extreme observations and we can achieve that aim uh, by using an appropriate updating rule based on the censored score. Okay. Now, we can actually visualise this uh, dominance of the uh, focus Bayesian uh, method over exact uh, uh, Bayes by visualising how these two different predictive distributions, mean predictive distributions, change over time relative to the true predictive distribution. So we can actually look at that in this particular case because we're in an artificial simulation case where we have access to the true predictive distribution. And I'm just going to, again, just focus on the upper tail accuracy and I'm just going to show you results for the ARCH1 predictive class i.e. the most misspecified class, arguably, because that's where this dominance is most pronounced. Okay, so to do that, I have to now switch over to my other set of slides. Okay. Oops. Okay, just, <laughs> just don't look for a moment. <laughs> I want to go back to the beginning. I'll tell you what to look for in a minute. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. So just starting at time period 501 for the sake of it, okay, because we obviously have to start with a certain estimation period of 500, so that's where the 501 is coming from. Um, and we're going to move these predictions through time, these predictive distributions through time. So what have we got here? So the red guy is the true predictive distribution. Now that doesn't have a closed form solution for that model, but we can simulate from the model and we can use those simulated draws to produce a kernel density estimate. And that's why it's a bit bumpy looking, but you can see how it's of course got the skewness that we have um, imposed in the simulation uh, scheme in the model. The green guy is the mean predictive from the exact Bayesian update. And the blue guy is the mean predictive from the focused Bayesian update. And the black line is the threshold beyond which we are looking for tail accuracy. And the key thing to remember is both the green and the blue line, are, or the green and blue curves, are averages over Gaussian arch predictive models. So what I want you to keep an eye on as, as I animate the graphs are these, these, these upper tails here. And you'll see how the blue curve is going to shift a little bit in location and certainly in shape in a way that renders its upper tail a very accurate prediction of the red upper tail and much more so than is the upper tail of the green curve. Okay, so that's what's going to happen. And sometimes, as we'll see, we get a upper tail representation or estimate here that is absolutely spot on. And it's absolutely spot on despite the fact that the overall shape of the blue curve is absolutely nothing like the overall shape of the red curve because, of course, the arch Gaussian arch predicted class is very misspecified. But, of course, the updating is ensuring that despite that fact, we actually estimate the upper tail accurately and that's all we care about. Okay. Now, of course, we don't have to just look at the mean predictives. We've got the whole posterior distribution of these uh, predictives. And there are, you know, for the two, you know, the two um, posteriors, sorry, uh, and, you know, there's a whole different way in which we can exploit and visualise that posterior variation. But one easy way of doing that, of course, is to summarise the draws of the predictives themselves in terms of a scalar, a scalar that in this particular case is affected by upper tail predictive accuracy. And therefore, we can produce two different posterior distributions for that scalar. So that's an easy way to, to visualise the posterior uh, variation. So we're looking at this expected shortfall, you know, all these words float around this financial world, but it's just the conditional mean, okay? It's just the expected return conditional on the return falling in the upper 10% tail. So it's just a conditional mean. And it's the expected return, therefore, in what is the worst case scenario in the case of this 
so-called short portfolio, which simply means something that we have sold and that we have to uh, uh, buy back at a later stage and therefore we care about high positive returns. Or in other words, we care about the price going up because that means we have to buy back the portfolio at the higher prices. So what we care about is the upper tail and being accurate in our prediction of high returns. Yep. Okay, so we can, and that's just a number, that's just a scalar, a scalar I should say, and we can produce the posterior based on the two different updating methods uh, for that scalar, and we can superimpose that on the true expected shortfall at any one point in time, and we can look at how those posteriors, where they're located relative to the truth, and how concentrated they are around the truth. And I'm just going to show you the results again for the ARCH1 predictive class. So we start again. Oops, hang on. I've started at the wrong time. <laughs> Go back in time. I was fiddling before, obviously. Just turn off for a minute. I want to just go back to 501 because uh, I want to start where we were before. Okay, so the red line here is, is just that one expected shortfall associated with that uh, true predictive distribution associated with that point in time. So that's just a number, that's just a summary of that predictive distribution. The green curve here is the posterior distribution for the expected shortfall based on exact Bayes, and the blue one is the posterior distribution based on focus Bayesian prediction. And you know, as fits the fact that the focus Bayesian method is 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 more, much more accurate in the upper tail than exact Bayes, this posterior distribution is closer to the truth and more concentrated at a point nearer to the truth. And if we move those things through time you can see that those, that relative, that relationship between the blue and green curve uh, remains the same. So the blue is always closer to the red and often very concentrated at a point very close to the red. So focusing on upper tail accuracy in the update has really borne fruit, if you like, in terms of uh, 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 nailing uh, this expected shortfall summary uh, very accurately. So that, that's the point there. And of course, we have tested all of this out on uh, empirical data with a couple of uh, different returns uh, series, and we were very pleased to see how uh, how well the method worked in, in that empirical setting and how, how much uh, bang for the buck we got in, in that empirical setting, and including when it comes to um, uh, accurate estimations of the value at risk, so that conditional quantile quantity that's important in, in, in finance, and uh, we got uh, very, very accurate um, estimates of the coverage of, uh, or very, you know, accurate uh, empirical coverages associated with our predictive uh, values at risk. All right, but enough finance, okay? because what I want to do is actually finish off by showing you some empirical results that are based on a very, very different type of empirical application. And really quite a, ch <laughs> quite a challenging empirical application when I, when I think about it. So what we decided to do was pit ourselves against competitors in the so-called M4 forecasting competition, okay, which was uh, the competition's been and gone, okay, but we're going to uh, kind of redo some of the results, if you like, okay. And the competition involves about 100-odd uh, groups of people um, providing different forecast models and methods, and the idea is to accurately forecast 100,000 different time series. <laughs> so it's a biggie. Okay. And the winner is uh, had, had the one who has the best out of sample predictive accuracy over all horizons and all series. And of course, they have a few different measures of predictive accuracy, as you would expect. Uh, and we're going to, because our focus is on probabilistic prediction, uh, we have picked the so called mean scale uh, interval score, which is all about accuracy in terms of uh, predictive intervals, okay? So that was the best or the most, the closest type of score, uh, uh, most relevant score for our, for our focus or our emphasis. And you, know, you don't have to know exactly what that is, but you know, as you expect, it's going to penalize a predictive, uh, prediction interval if the observed value falls outside the prediction interval, 
appropriately weighted by the nominal coverage of the interval and rewards a narrow prediction interval. Now, just to make our life <laughs> feasible, or make the exercise feasible, we chose to uh, uh, focus only on the 23,000 annuals here. That meant we only had to use the cluster of two universities rather than, you know, <laughs> 10. <laughs> so we uh, apply our focus Bayesian method to each one of these 23,000 series. And of course, we use the mean scale interval score in the updating step. Now, of course, we have to choose a predictive class. And as I said, it has to be a plausible predictive class. You can't choose something nutty. So what we did was choose a predictive class that performed well in the competition overall. And that was the so-called exponential smoothing model, which our colleagues uh, at Monash uh, developed uh, many years ago. So the question is, of course, does applying the Bayesian updating to this particular pre predictive model, driving the updating by the predictive interval score, reap further benefits out of sample according to that particular scoring rule? That's the question. Answer to that question is yes. <laughs> and indeed, if we shift the goalpost a little bit, always handy, uh, we win. <laughs> Bad luck that the competition's already over, but anyway, <laughs> it was a bit of fun. And I'm going to just show you one table of numbers to, uh, well, convince you of that and to, to highlight a, a couple of important things that are going on here. So we're only measuring uh, accuracy in terms of predictive, this predictive interval score. So what we've done is we've taken the, the uh, four methods that ranked first to fourth in the overall competition, so in terms of uh, predicting the 100,000 series. And we are able to access those predictions, so we didn't have to rerun all of those forecasts, but what we've done is we have now tabulated the mean out of sample score um, for those four methods in terms of predicting these 23,000 annual series, okay? And you can see, and remembering that high scores are good and bold is best, that the ranking in the overall score, uh, sorry, in the overall competition is maintained when it comes to predicting the 23,000 annual series, yeah. So our method, oh, yes, now the ETS method here, uh, which was fourth in the overall, overall in the competition, is using maximum likelihood, so plug in maximum likelihood. So it's not a Bayesian method, but it's a, it's a, it's a likelihood-based method. So of course, we're taking the ETS model and we're applying the Bayesian dating. So does that uh, improve things over and above the likelihood-based version of the ETS model? Well, yes, it does by a small amount, but yes, we are reaping some benefit there. Okay, by updating according to the scoring rule that matters. However, it turns out if you look at the paper, you'll find that there's about 1% of the series where we, and indeed the ETS model itself, are not doing particularly well. And of course, that affects the mean. So let's chuck the mean and let's look at the median, of course, which means that we are not going to be affected by those extreme values. Once we do that, then the ETS model and certainly enhancement of the ETS model, if you like, is uh, doing much better and we are indeed uh, clearly winning them. And if you look at what we think is probably the best type of summary measure for this sort of exercise, and that is the number of series in which a particular method is the best, then this method here, our ETS method based on the, on the uh, Bayesian updating, the, the, the focused updating is doing best of all. Okay, so that was very, very pleasing. But if you take these, these numbers as a whole, there's a couple of things to, to, to take away from this. What we've done is we've started with a good model, a very flexible model that really does well with most of the time series, and we have enhanced it in the sense we have pushed it in the direction that is important to us and that has borne fruit. But there are still 
you know, let's say 1% of the, of the series for which another model, however estimated, does best. So in other words, this is kind of highlighting the fact that the predictive model is important. Okay, so we certainly did not expect that choosing one predictive model, applying it to all 23,000 series, uh, was going to uh, mean that we were going to be best in all 23,000 series. Okay, so the predictive class is still important and with such a variety of, of, of series here, obviously no one predictive class is going to be appropriate. But given a good choice of predictive class, moving things in the direction of predictive accuracy that's important to you does work. Yeah. So that's a good place to stop. So again, just, just, just summarising, and I will say something new right at the end. Um, Adapting the, the, the Bayesian update to focus on the forecast accuracy measure that's important to you does 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 work. Uh, you know, asymptotically, theoretically, certainly we, we show that. And in in the examples that we've looked at, simulation and empirical, we've seen uh, really some very pleasing uh, uh, positive results about how the how the method is working. Okay, it's very, very pleasing. Um, and so it is obviating, of course, the need to specify the predictive model correctly. But as I've said, it doesn't get away from the idea of, of, of starting off with a good, plausible predictive model. Okay, so that, that still is important. Um, we believe that theoretical niceties aside, uh, the, the work has, has practical import. And I like to think it's something that people do pick up on because it's pretty intuitive really I think when you when you look at it and certainly it doesn't involve it doesn't require any sophisticated Bayesian machinery okay we're just using standard uh, MCMC uh, algorithms here and it's important to remember too that you don't just have this with scoring rules you can you can drive it with general loss functions uh, in which predictive accuracy plays a role. So, you know, for example, in a, again, in an economic setting, um, you know, you can be looking at a loss function or a utility function associated with uh, optimal portfolio allocation. Uh, you can be looking at asymmetric loss functions of one sort or another uh, associated with uh, under and over prediction of various quantities of interest, including quite seriously quantities of interest in, in, in the current crisis. Okay, so in principle, whatever loss function your predictive context uh, requires uh, can be embedded in the updating scheme and uh, be used to, uh, to drive your, your predictive results. And that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Guy, for the excellent uh, talk. We can give you some virtual claps. Um, um, I also invite all the, the participants uh, to ask questions by using the ways of the hand uh, functionality. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Chris. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Well, first, of all, thank you very much, Gail. Yeah, it's a pleasure to hear you if, if from far away uh, <laughs> and, and to listen to, to your talk. My, I have a very uh, naive question. Do, do you have, because you spoke of misspecification from the beginning, do you have a, yes. an assessment of uh, cases where it, it does poorly? So can you characterize <laughs> cases where, where it, it does poorly? Oh, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a tricky question, yes. Um, I think that comes down to my uh, comment that you do have to choose a plausible predictive model. So we do have other work, uh, actually non-Bayesian work, where we're trying to, to drill down into that a little bit, a little bit more. Because if you choose, for example, a predictive class that is what we call in this other work uh, incompatible with the true data generating process. So not just misspecified, but actually incompatible in the sense that there are key aspects of the data generating process that you are not picking up with your model. And that 
incompatibility means that scoring rules are not able to reward what they are designed to reward, then you will not get buy-in through the updating using that scoring rule. So that's a direct answer to your question. Whether those um, examples are kind of quirky examples or whether they end up being something that you always have to be alert to, uh, my feeling is that most of the time you are going to just be, you know, because you're going to be doing diagnostic stuff and you know about how data works and you know you'll be experienced enough I think usually to choose a plausible predictive model but you do have to be alert to it that um, if it is missing out certain key characteristics of the data that the scoring rule wants to pin down then you can be in trouble yes Ralph Ralph <laughs> hi Gail um, I just wanted to ask a question about ETS I thought um, you would. So Ralph, of course, is one of the people in that. Et he's the et al. Yes, Heinemann et al. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yep. Very et al at the moment. Um, <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, yep. I've noticed you focused in your work on annual time series, which yes. um, typically has, in the maximum likelihood context, reasonably well behaved. Uh, likelihood functions, but what we've discovered lately is that as soon as you move to seasonal series, um, likelihood, likelihood, likelihood function can have many local maxima, and sort of bizarre things happen. You might find the global optima, but you find that you get better out of sample performance from um, one of the local rather than the global optima. And so it seems to me that the maximum likelihood approach is pretty thorny. And mm -hmm. I've been puzzling over whether the Bayesian approach might be a way of bypassing some of these nasty properties of the likelihood function because using, an, in a sense, an averaging approach. Uh, well, I was there's wondering two. You could comment on that. Well there, well, there are really three things to say to that. I mean, one is that, of course, we're moving away from the use of likelihood within the Bayesian approach. So yeah. that's point one. Um, yeah. Point two is that whether we had run a, a Bayesian version of the ETS model, how that would have gone, I don't know the answer to that question. But the, uh, that yeah. was not our, our, our emphasis, of course. We wanted to move away from the likelihood. Cool. The third thing is we do have another another strand of work which um, where we're looking at the whole 100,000 series where we are working um, uh, harder, if you like, on the characteristics of those series, including the seasonality. You are absolutely right that once you move away from the um, annual series, you have to put more work into the specification of the predicted class. Yes. Good, thanks, Kurt. <laughs> yes, Dennis. Yeah. Hi, Gail. Very nice talk. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice to hear you. Um, so my question is: um, you had this nice asymptotic result that the choice of weights didn't matter asymptotically. Did yeah. you find it difficult to to select the weight uh, in practice for in a non-asymptotic setting? Well, as I said, we tried a few different things. We found usually it didn't matter too much. Now, probably that's because we are dealing with pretty big samples, I would say, most of the time. Okay? Um, but uh, what we settled upon made sense to us. It seemed, you know, it seemed justifiable. Um, and when we played around with different things, nothing much changed. But again, I'm not quite sure whether that result was to some extent dependent on the fact that we're always looking at pretty large samples. So the asymptotics is kind of sitting in there. Um, but, you know, if you look at this generalised Bayesian uh, inference literature, you know, there's a lot of work on thinking about the, the, the choice of the weights, at least in these other inference-based problems. Um, uh, yes, I mean, we, we had a particular 
you know, focus and emphasis and, and it ends up that the weight, you know, it doesn't seem to be play a huge role, the choice of the weight in, in our setting here. But it still sits there as an interesting part of this generalised inference or generalised Bayes literature. Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Herman, please. Yeah. Hi, Gail. Hello. Uh, hi. As I expected, crystal clear of uh, difficult, sometimes materials. My questions are one or two, and there's some comments. Can you, in your procedure, can you also measure the level of misspecification among the byproduct? Because hey, you said uh, sometimes yeah. when it's less misspecified, uh, that's, a, that's one question. My second yeah. is a comment. I saw that you said choose a good predictive class B in the experiment was very important. Uh, and in the uh, with this winning contest, you choose a very clever uh, predictive class from earlier. Uh, so how yeah. robust how robust is that? And my third and then final point is you had. Uh, then a score, then uh, I, I noted, I not, it jotted down the number, 5,823. Now, in exact Bayesian oh. analysis, you can do oh. a density. Yeah, you can do it. Uh, you can do some uncertainty around that score. How is that in your approach? Can you do uh, a reliability in, in of the scores? Uh, when, when in, in regular based and simulation based analysis, then you can do that. And how is that in your approach? So these are my three questions. Or, or, or. Okay, so if I just go to the second one first, because sure. the choice of the predictive class matters in the sense that that's your starting point. But as long as you've got a reasonable predictive class, the whole idea is that you're going to enhance your predictive uh, results by moving away from the uh, updating based on the likelihood function to the updating based on to the uh, based on the predictive accuracy that you're interested in. So in principle, you will always enhance the results associated with a good predictive model. I think that's a, a reasonable statement to make. Okay. So, but your predictive model provides you, you, your starting point. And I think the example we had with the stochastic volatility model, skewness and all that sort of stuff, and the ARCH model was quite a nice one because you'd say, okay, ARCH1 is, that's plausible, but it's not going to be great. And you can see that you get a large amount of enhancement because of the degree of misspecification, despite the fact that it was still a plausible starting point, okay? So the less the degree of misspecification, if you'd like, the less buy-in you're going to get. Because, of course, the less misspecified the model, the closer you're going to get to truly representing the GDP, so the likelihood is no longer going to be misspecified. You run with your likelihood, okay? Um, how you measure misspecification, well, that's the big unanswered question, isn't it? I mean, it's always going to be, to some extent, uh, to some extent case-specific as to how you develop a spectrum along which you measure misspecification. Okay. Um, now, what was the one? I didn't quite get the one about the score. Uh, oh, the, um, the uncertainty, uh, to measure the uncertainty around the scores. Hey, you, you were winning, huh? and what I usually... Oh, yes, uh, yes, I, yes, yes. Oh. No, we have, you know, that's a very good, uh, very good point. Uh, we haven't done any, say, uh, uh, you know, tests uh, of, of, of predictive accuracy or that sort of thing, or and we haven't done a Bayesian assessment of the difference. No, we have not. Okay, thank you. Yes, good, good, good question. Okay, thank you. Anyone, any further questions? If not, I think we, we just uh, thank uh, Gail again for, for the excellent
and, and very interesting uh, talk. And then uh, the, the next uh, presentation in our, in our series will be in, in two weeks time. So thanks again, Gan, for, for your thank presentation. You. Thank you, Michael and uh, Massey for, for organising this. And yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. <laughs> I will pleasure. <laughs> All right.